She kissed him, holding him tight. His lips so soft and perfect they felt like home. Oh my god, I'm gonna throw up because that's disgusting. But that was so cute. Hello friends, my name is Lauren and welcome back to my channel. I have been wanting to make this video for the longest time ever since I finished the fifth book in the School for Good and Evil series last year. I was so excited immediately after I finished that book to see how this amazing series was gonna end. And as of last night at 1 a.m., I finished the sixth and final book in this series. And I am quite excited to discuss it today because after finishing it, I was a mess and I'm very happy to now finally discuss my thoughts with all of you. In honor of the sixth book, coming out, I actually reread the entire series, so the first five books, so I would remember all of the details. And surprisingly, my opinions changed on almost all of the books. This video is going to be entirely dedicated to my thoughts on the sixth book, so if you have not yet read the School for Good and Evil series or you kind of forget stuff, I will be having a video going through all of my thoughts on all of the books and like what they're about coming out this Thursday, I believe, so stay tuned for that. If you want to learn more about what the series is about or if you're thinking about reading it or just want to hear my updated thoughts, be sure to stay tuned for Thursday because that's the video you're gonna want to watch more than this one. But like I said, today we'll be focusing on the sixth book, The School for Good and Evil, One True King. I know it's been about three weeks since this book has come out, but I know there's still many people that don't want to be spoiled. So the way this video is going to work is I am going to start off with just some general thoughts on this book. I won't have too many thoughts to share because it is like the sixth book in a series. So obviously I can't really share too much, but I will share a couple thoughts and then I will jump into the spoiler section where I will talk about what this book is about, what happened, all my thoughts, etc. All of the timestamps will be down below in the description if you want to jump to like a specific part or skip over a certain part So check that out there as well to see everything that will be in this video I'm gonna give a clear warning before I jump into the spoiler section But first let's jump into the non-spoiler section just my overall thoughts on this book This can like chill up here for now. I'm gonna start off with one of the most I don't know exciting things I think most people care about, which is my rating on this book, which shows how much I liked the book or if I didn't like it at all. And honestly, as I was reading this book, I was debating on a couple different ratings as I was going through. Sometimes I thought I would give it a 3.5 out of 5 stars, a 4 out of 5 stars, or even a 4.5 out of 5 stars. I honestly thought I wouldn't love this book as much as I did as I was reading it. By the time I got to the end, I knew I could not give this book anything less than 4.5 out of 5 stars. I wouldn't declare this book one of my favorite books of all time, so hence it's not a 5 out of 5 stars, but wow. It was close. The ending of this book was honestly the reason why I gave this book such a high rating. And it's honestly probably not for the reason you would think, but I will get into that more once we get into the spoiler section. But there was something in this book that I just loved so much. And for that reason, I had to just give it a 4.5 out of 5 stars and not anything lower. However, like I said, this is the sixth book in the series. So there isn't too much I can really say without, you know, giving spoilers away like plots and stuff like that but there are some things I want to mention about the characters. Something I love in this book, and honestly the series in general, is Sophie and Agatha. We can see them, you know, they're always on the front cover, like they're always making an appearance. This story is about them. Hence their fairy tale is called The Tale of Sophie and Agatha. And I honestly love these two so much. Not only do I love their friendship together and how they've worked so hard to build the bond they have, but I just love them as separate people and characters and how you can really see their own personal growth. Agatha's character growth was pretty steady over the books. I would say she had the most development in the original trilogy, specifically the first book and the third book, and was kind of steady in book like four and five, but she did have a little bit extra growth in this book for a reason I will not name because, you know, spoilers, but her growth was relatively pretty steady over the series, this book included. However, Sophie, on the other hand, she had a lot of character development in this book. She's already moved to such a place where she has grown so much from where we started off in the series, but she grew even more in this book and I just loved seeing that because there's always something more someone can learn or improve from and Sophie was a great example of just always improving her character and I, I just, I was living for it. And one character that I was kind of annoyed by and kind of always have been annoyed by is Tedros, the main like male protagonist character. I swear, like sometimes it, it seems like he's grown so much and then like three pages later he's like so psych and then we're back to square one. So overall for character growth, I would say as much as you need good characters, you need them to have some kind of story of their own. Like they have to grow and you have to have, it has to show in the story. And I would say for Tedros, it wasn't exactly as there as it was for Sophie and Agatha. So that was something I didn't really necessarily enjoy as much, but 
Regardless, I still loved this book. I also loved all of the side characters in this book. I think the author does a great job at making sure each side character we're introduced to gets some kind of ending of some kind, or at least comes back to them and explains what's going on in their life. Like the Coven, 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 I don't, Coven? I think, yeah, the Coven. The three of them, uh, Hester, Anadil, and Dot, I loved them. I loved the, like, the villains in the story and the backstory we got. I thought everything was really well done, really well written, and overall just really entertaining. And while, of course, I'm sure there are things to improve, overall, I just had a really fun time reading this book. The ending made it all worth it. And so for that reason, I gave this book a 4.5 out of 5 stars. And I would suggest you read if you just finished the fifth book and want to continue on with the series. That is all I'm going to say for the non-spoiler section in this video because there is only so much I can say due to this being like number six in the series. So that's all I'm going to mention. But if you do have any like non-spoiler questions, feel free to ask them. I'll be happy to answer. Also, this kind of also goes for people that have questions that are spoiler. Please leave like a spoiler warning at the top of your comment before you comment it because I know like people haven't in the past and like you don't want other people to get spoiled. So like if you have any spoilery question for me at all, just make sure you put the spoiler alert in the first line of your comment. And I'm going to be jumping into the spoiler section now. So if you do not want to be spoiled, do not keep on watching. Yeah. <laughs> this book starts off in chaos. Like that's the easiest way to put it. Basically, Japeth in the last book just killed his twin brother, Ryan. And since Ryan was trying to become the king, Japeth has now taken his place and everyone sees Japeth as Ryan because they look the same. It kind of starts off like, whoa, and everyone's like being fooled by this one guy. That's crazy. Then we also learn that Sophie has been like brainwashed to love Japeth, even though she knows how much of a monster and villain he is. And it's like, how did that happen? Why, why, why? But. Luckily, Tedros and Agatha swoop on in on their like bubble things, don't really know how that happened. So the book starts off at this coronation that goes wrong, and once King Ryan or Japeth tries to be crowned, the crown will not accept him, Xavier flies away from him and goes back into the stone, and reveals that King Arthur actually left three trials for the two people trying to become the king of Camelot. So all of a sudden then, Sophie tries to kill Agatha because she's being brainwashed, Agatha and Tedros leave, and then the three trials are just out there waiting to be completed. And that's kind of where we start start off this story. The way I'm going to do this review is not kind of chronological order. It's kind of going to be what I want it to be, but I'm going to have everything, like I said before, lined out in the description, so you can check the timestamps there. But I'm going to kind of start off with something I didn't necessarily like in this book. And so first we're going to start off with characters, specifically Tedros. I like Tedros as a character, but there were definitely some moments where his like lack of character development, once again, just annoyed me. Something that annoyed me is the fact, like I already said, Tedros Tedros goes from like being a great person, showing some kind of development, to then doing something stupid that makes me question if he really learned anything in the beginning. And if you're trying to make a character have growth, you, you don't want to do that, you know? Like keep going back on everything he's learning, you know? I wasn't a fan of it. So for example, we have this nice page at the beginning of the story on page 66 between Tedros and Agatha. I love you, he whispered. I promise you, he whispered, his blue eyes afire. We will be married. You will be my queen, Agatha, because you deserve a happy ending. And I will find a way to get us there. Trust me, that's all I ask. I need you to trust me. And so then they have this like nice little moment together for like the first time in a while. And it was nice. I'm like, maybe Tedros is fine taking the lead. He's like, Agatha, trust me, I'm gonna like do what it takes to like become king and all this kind of stuff. But then he just goes like back on his word like so many times and it's really annoying. Often something Tedros accuses Agatha of, and honestly it's true, is that Agatha always takes the lead on his quests. But it's not because Agatha's trying to put her prince down, it's because she's doing what it takes when he doesn't realize that's what it takes. And so Agatha's out doing this quest trying to find something for Tedros and he realizes this all of a sudden. He's like, Agatha who is out there right now fighting Tedros' battle, all on her own, and here Tedros was, twiddling his thumbs just like he had at Camelot when Agatha had absurd his quest the first time. The mistake that started it all. But he'd learned from that, Tedros thought angrily. He was different now. He was ready to be king. If only his princess would stay out of the way. Like, how does he go from being so loving and caring to, like, accusing his princess of, like, trying to, like, steal his crown from him or, like, be the king or always do what he's supposed to be doing? He's the one that should be doing it. And so she's just picking up the slack. And I don't understand why he's so angry. If he knew this, if he had a problem with her always stepping up, why didn't he step up in the first place? 
you know? And even once he knows this, it, it still has to be reminded to him multiple times. And this is even when Robin Hood had to tell him this. Like, get to Agatha, get the pearl, he told the prince, I'll hold him off. Tedros tried to push past Robin. Princess, not pride, Hood snarled at him. The words hit Tedros hard. Robin was right. If the snake killed him, Agatha would be next. Even his nemesis wasn't worth that. He has all these like parts of him that wants different things. Like he's always trying to like say, I'm the prince, I'm supposed to protect you, but then also does the exact opposite of what he's telling Agatha. So it's just these things like this that annoyed me. It's like, what do you actually believe Tedros? Cause like, I don't know. Another thing that annoyed me about Tedros is the fact that literally his like princess Agatha is like always calling out like the sexist remarks or sexist things that happen in like this fairy tale or the kingdom. Yet Tedros here, literally is being sexist himself and it makes me question like how does he get away with this like how is he allowed to have these thoughts while trying to fight to be the king of Camelot basically the most important kingdom in the woods I don't get it so he says and yet he still had misgivings about the knight's plan Depeth relinquished the throne by choice the snake surrendered for love only women could invest in such a plot. What is he doing? <laughs> like, the villain of the story is Japheth. Yes, and he's doing everything he's doing so he can bring back Eric from the dead, his like one true love, his only friend. And Tedros is like, how could this villain like just want love? Like that's such a, a girl thing to do. Like, bro. Like, I don't know. It just rubs me the wrong way, you know? So it's just things like that where he goes from being really good to really bad in like a couple pages and it's just like, why? Like, why is he doing this? Like, you'd think there'd be some growth over the pages, but no. There was another thing he says that it was actually smart. It's on page 400 and 401. And he basically talks all about how, why he thinks like the tests were set up as they were. The first one was to test like Tedros and Japheth. The second one was to test whoever Tedros's wife was going to be. So Agatha in this case, because the test was to like kill Agatha because she intercepted the first time, which I'll talk about later. But he's like, but we will win somehow. I promised you that from the beginning. You are the queen, Agatha, my queen. We're unbreakable in a way that Arthur and and Guinevere never were, which means we're not gonna die from this. We are gonna come out stronger. And like he goes on like for like two whole pages talking about this kind of stuff. And it's like, wow, it was such like a mature, deep thing to say. But then how like a hundred pages ago do you now become sexist? Like I don't understand. Because his character growth keeps flip-flopping back and forth. Anyways, I did not like it. There definitely are other instances towards the end of the book showing he's grown, such as his like big speech to everyone before he tries to pull out the sword, and then also at the end how he proposed to Agatha, which was really cute, really liked that. But there was just so many instances of him like having no character growth. I was like, where is this good character growth coming from all of a sudden? So for those reasons, Tedros kind of annoyed me. I still liked his character, but I was also kind of annoyed by him as well. And now that we've talked a lot of negative things, I want to talk about the, honestly, like one of the sole reasons I I loved this book as much as I did, why I increased my rating probably from a 4 to a 4.5, which might not be a big difference, but it is because it's a really high rating. It is because of Hort and Sophie. Now ever since the first book, I have wanted Hort and Sophie to get together so bad, especially in the third book when we have this scene with Hort and Agatha with the wish fish. And wish fish, their whole purpose is you put your finger in like the water or whatever and the wish fish show you like your heart's desire. And Hort and Agatha were together and Hort did it and he saw a vision of him getting married to Sophie. But the reason they thought that this was going to be the future was because at the time Agatha and Tedros were having problems, but in this scene, Tedros and Agatha were there like happily holding hands like together. And Hort was like, I hate Tedros too much to ever wish him any happiness, especially with like someone like you, Agatha. And so the fact that it was like almost shown to be the future, I was like, this has to come true. If it doesn't, it, it just can't, it has to come true. This was actually even mentioned in the book, this past scene. And when that scene was mentioned in the sixth book, I was like, they have to end up together. Cause if they don't, like why would they mention that scene again in the sixth book? And so at that point I was like, they have to end up together. However, obviously Hort had a girlfriend at the time. So obviously they could not end up together, but there were some key moments that definitely made me question if this relationship was going to last. One example of this is on page 168. It's a conversation between Hort and Nicole. Nicole is being his girlfriend and I'll come with you Hort insisted Nicole hesitated you don't want me to the weasel asked of course I do it's just a boy will mess up our plan a boy I'm your boyfriend Hort blasted I'm not even allowed to look at Sophie my soulmate you can slag me off like I'm any old boy on the street and here I thought I was your soulmate Nicole replied <laughs> so um clearly you know Hort has always thought of Sophie as a soulmate rather than his actual girlfriend which you know problematic a little bit 
But you know, I was getting the signs that, that you know, they were probably gonna break up and then Hort and Sophie were finally gonna get together. <laughs> then there was also other scenes after that leading up towards it. For example, there was one where like Hort and Sophie were just having like a deep conversation and just like being really close together. Then obviously when Hort and Nicole actually broke up later on, that was obviously like a big sign that, you know, they weren't gonna end up together. So who else could Hort and, and Sophie end up together with, you know? And then there was this one scene where Sophie asks Hort what him and Tedros were talking about. And Hort says, I was asking him for girl advice, okay? Sophie hesitated. What kind of girl advice? Like what it was to you to know? No, I don't know. What it was like to kiss you. And so obviously Sophie, they was like what what how do I respond to this and then they talk about that for a few moments but then they have this conversation right after that conversation finishes and it's like Sophie crosses her arms what I'm saying is what I'm saying she looked up at Hort I don't know what I'm saying the two of them stared hard into each other's eyes the silence as thick and wide as the ocean and then they, they were just staring at each other like I swear they were about to kiss or something big was gonna happen but then obviously like as the story goes they get intercepted and then the conversation is done and then a little bit more into that conversation Sophie crackled so loud it woke Merlin up oh Hort you really are a goon better than being a sad soft boy Hort muttered why are those bad things Sophie came back with why can't a boy show his emotions why can't a boy just be himself because girls like you won't go for us said Hort grimly have you ever considered it is because you are a real boy in all your softness and sadness that I'm having this conversation with you to begin with? I can have any handsome boy in the woods, but they're insufferable like Tedros or possessive like Raphael or manical like Ryan. But I had to learn that that wouldn't make me happy. The same way you had to kiss Nicole to learn that there was something missing. The same way I had to spend time with you again and again to learn that you aren't creepy, useless Hort after all, but Hort who is open and true, yes, sad and soft, but altogether sweet and the strongest boy I know. And I'm like... If they don't end up together after that conversation, love isn't real. That's it. That's it. Potentially one of my favorite moments in this book is, well, not favorites, is when Hort almost died. And like we were convinced he died. And then I was sitting there. This was like in the last hundred pages of the book. I was like, I refuse to believe it. I was like, there is no way that Hort can die because he has to end up with Sophie. And if he's dead, he can't end up with Sophie. And so the fact that he died or died saving Sophie, I was like, my heart can't even take this. Um, and then we later have a spot with Sophie and Agatha after Hort has like died or we don't know what happened to him really and it's Agatha's point of view on like Sophie and Hort and this is what she says or this is the like monologue part that Sophie had fallen in love with Hort was as natural as it was surprising on one hand Agatha couldn't believe it had happened and on the other she couldn't fathom it not happening even after Sophie had rejected the possibility time and time again Around Hort, Sophie was the Sophiest of all, and Hort was the hortiest at all, each the deepest version of themselves. Bared to each other without shame or fear or regret, and isn't that what love is? That magical force that makes you more you. The way Agatha made Tedros more Tedros, and Tedros made Agatha more Agatha. Sophie had tried to find another equation for love. All the boys she'd loved before were gorgeous or edgy or mystical, but they'd held her back or pushed her towards something she didn't want to be or couldn't be. Hort loved Sophie as herself, and any boy who could love the real Sophie for all her incarnations was the only prince deserving of her love. It just took Hort dying for Sophie to see it. How? <sighs> I'm not okay. I'm not. That was so good. It was so good. And then the end of the book. The last chapter hit, and I was like, there is no way. Where is Hort? He, no way he could have actually died. Thank God he didn't actually die. And then we have this nice satisfying conclusion. It's Tedros' and Agatha's wedding day and all of a sudden Agatha comes with Hort and brings Hort to Sophie and it's like wow amazing and then we have Sophie saying this to Hort you've always been enough Hort of Bloodbrook said Sophie you who are strong enough to die for the girl you love and still find a way back to her you old big-hearted beautiful you it was me who wasn't enough me who kept searching for fantasy love instead of real love. It was me who didn't deserve you until I opened my heart big enough and found you there, waiting patiently, a piece of me all along. She kissed him, holding him tight, his lips so soft and perfect they felt like home. Oh my god, I'm gonna throw up because that's disgusting. But that was so cute. That was so cute. <sighs> so yeah, that's everything I want to say about Hort and Sophie. I'm so happy they got together. Like that was one of the biggest reasons I loved this book because I love, of course, yes, Agatha and Tedros are great, but this is the real romance we've been waiting for all along because I knew, I knew since the third book that they were gonna end up together in the end. 
They just had to, and then they did. Let's talk about other character development and other things that happen with characters, specifically Agatha. Agatha's character growth was probably the most straightforward in this book out of like her other books as well, but it was because she was always too controlling or didn't trust Tedros fully or just didn't trust everyone else fully because when she had an idea, she was like, this is what we gotta go with. Not to be like dismissive of everyone else, just because she lacked always trusting. And so we learned in this book, she learns to like trust other people, especially Tedros, because one of the biggest problems in the past was that she didn't always believe Tedros had what it took to be king no matter how much she loved him. But then the more she trusts in him, the more she learns he actually does. And in the end, he risks his own life to like save everyone else and it ends up coming out successful. So thank God she trusted him. <laughs> but that was her character growth in this book, I think, because she definitely has learned other lessons in the previous books. But in this book, that was the main lesson, at least I saw for her. And I definitely think she came out successful and like a better person at the end of it. As for Sophie's character development, I kind of already mentioned it. It's mostly having to do with Hort because Sophie has always wanted to find love. And in the original trilogy, we find that she's always trying to find like that grand storybook kind of love. And at the end of the third book, she just wants to be happy alone. But then as we get into the Camelot yearbooks, we learn that she is happy alone and she is like strong, independent, but she also wants someone to love as well, more than just Agatha. And it takes her a while to find that the person like that would love her for everything she is was there all along. And she finally gets there and it's like, Yes! And so I loved her development. She learns that she doesn't have to have this like unrealistic standard, like that's not realistic per se, but just someone that will love you for all of who you are rather than trying to push you somewhere else. And that was a lesson that took her a long time to learn, but after six books, we made it, boys. <laughs> and then Agatha and Sophie together. Let's talk about them. I love their friendship and always will. Like I said at the beginning, they're some of my favorite characters in this book, or my favorite characters in this book, honestly. There was once a point in this book where Sophie like kind of wished almost that her and Agatha could just have a happy ending together. But obviously due to how everything's changed, that's not gonna happen. It showed that Sophie really values Agatha as a friend. And throughout the story, both of them really wanna spend time together and help each other. And it just shows how strong their bond of friendship is and that no matter how different they are, they will be friends no matter what. Sophie defends Agatha when she acted like the king, saying things like Agatha swallowed the answer to stop Dupeth from claiming it first. Tedros had plenty of chances to win, but as usual, he didn't get the job done. It was Agatha who saved him from losing. It was Agatha who saved us from the snake being ahead in the race. If anything, it was she who acted like king. Agatha blushed with love. Sophie, her knight in shining armor. Sophie, who had broken herself to heal her best friend. Sophie, who had found the good in her even when Agatha thought herself evil. And so their friendship has always been so good. They love each other so much. And it's part of the reason why I love this book so much is because of their friendship. And specifically in this book, it's stronger than ever. And I just love that after all this past, the things in the past that they've went through, they're finally able to just be super happy together. And then also it's definitely Sophie who shows, I think a little bit more of her love towards Agatha rather than Agatha towards Sophie. It's always there with Agatha, but in this book specifically, it's definitely Sophie who shows it more outwardly. For example, when Jepeth the snake tries to kill Agatha, Sophie sees this and does like her big witch scream again and he almost dies because of it and I was like that's some awesome protecting best friend stuff right there. I loved it. I loved their friendship. It was so good. I don't know how else to say it. It was amazing. And then I think the last main character driven thing I want to talk about is the coven. Hester, Anadil, and Dot. I loved them. There was this really nice scene with Dot, Hester, and Anadil when Dot finds out her father has died and this is what Dot says. You're my real family, you know, Dot said softly to her friends, and I know I'm part of yours too. Even if you act like I'm not, even if you two pretend you don't need me, a coven is three, it has to be three, <laughs> because I'd be so lonely without you. Now Hester had teared up and so did Anadil. We love you, Dot, Hester whispered, even if sometimes we want to push you down a well. And you know, if that's not a friendship, what is? These three nevers like have always had like mess abuse of love but together they've really found something special and I just I loved it. We also learn from Dot's father that Dot was made from love and that was like a big thing too because villain families are known for being broken and they are never built on love but Dot actually was. She was she's technically like half ever half never I guess based off just her parents and how it was actually love and how she learns of her mother later on in the story and I was like this is so pure and wholesome. Dot is so nice she deserves the world and I loved the fact that she actually got some closure from her family like that. And speaking of love Hester and Anadil basically started dating and I was kind of living for it because we knew this was happening since like I think book 
four, I want to say almost. I'm not sure if I remember seeing it in book three, but definitely in book four, there were hints of it starting to happen, which I really liked. And so the fact that they kind of all had their own little happy ending made me really happy. This is kind of all I want to say about the characters that I can really think of right now. Like I said, if you have any questions for me, feel free to leave me a comment down below. But now I'm going to try to transfer a little bit into more of the like plot of the book, specifically like the three tests. One of my favorite parts in this book and it really got me re-engaged in the story is when it was like this big fight towards the end of act one and then everyone reaches for the pearl when Agatha then swallows it. I thought that was so funny because everyone just looked at her like what do we do now? Like this was never something we thought was gonna happen. And so I really liked that part. And it also just got you like re-engaged in the story because then, then you learn the second test, which is that Jepeth and Tedros have to kill Agatha. And it's like, how on earth is Tedros, literally his like almost wife, he has to kill her? Like how on earth are they gonna get out of that situation? It was really cool. Also, Sophie really came through as she was the one that was able to get the beard and the pearl from Japheth in the first place. So Sophie's iconic, Agatha's iconic. They're amazing, like I've said before. Another thing I really liked was the genie cave. Tedros's plan was actually so smart. And the fact that no one told Agatha really showed her that she needs to start trusting people more because his plan actually was really, really successful and really worked out in the end. And it was really smart. And I actually really loved seeing Tedros act as Eric and then talk to Japheth because I think at least for a small period of time Japheth thought Tedros as Eric was actually Eric and it was really nice to see him like be a little softer for once rather than just the ruthless murderer villain he was because even the ruthless murderer villain has a heart somewhere in there. Oh another thing I want to mention this was kind of a flashback scene to Arthur and Rosella. Their friendship or like love connection was amazing. I loved them. I wish Arthur at the time would have realized that Grizel was the person he actually wanted to be with rather than picking a queen for good because obviously in the end that did not actually work out but the fact that they actually had a secret heir to the throne and just never mentioned it to anyone. That was a big plot twist, which I'll talk about more in like a few moments, but that was kind of iconic. I loved that scene at the bar or restaurant, wherever they were, and how they were like, we have to spend some time alone and talk about this. It was some good stuff. Moving back to the plot, the next thing that kind of happened was there was four Agathas and Sophie had to determine which Agatha was the real Agatha. But what ended up happening is Japheth thought Agatha number four was actually Agatha and Tedros thought Agatha number four was Japheth. So they both like slashed her at the same time and it ended up being Guinevere, Tedros's mother. And so Tedros's mother died protecting him almost because the test was the fact that Tedros had to kill Agatha. And technically, he did kill Agatha, just not the real Agatha. So I thought that was smart in the way it was done and like how she kind of wanted to die so she could go like be with Lancelot, like her one true love. But like, it was still so sad because so many adults in this book died and it was like, who's left, honestly? I also, like I said, I loved learning that Chaddick was actually the true heir of the book because like I did not see that coming at all. It seemed super far-fetched to me to be honest but the fact that it was explained and how Grisella and Arthur had a connection from the beginning and they didn't tell anyone about this it made a lot of sense in the end and I really liked that almost because Chadwick was definitely someone deserving I could see of the throne. He was really good, he was loyal but in the end it was Tedros that was going to make the better king. That was kind of the last big moment I feel that happened in the plot itself because then you know Japheth gets exposed, Tedros does this nice speech, we get to the wedding scene, all that kind of stuff, we know what happens. But I really liked the fact that it gets explained really well with the backstory of everyone. It was done super well. I also liked throughout the book, we have no idea who Japheth's real parents are because in the last book, we thought it was Evelyn Slater and Arthur, but we actually learn it's Evelyn Slater and the evil schoolmaster, Raphael. I think that's his name. No, it's not Raphael. Raphael. Raphael? Rafal. Rafal. That's his name. Rafal. Evelyn Slater and Rafal were actually the parents and it was really cool how the two sons were actually named after like the evil schoolmaster and the good schoolmaster. Hence Japheth's first name is Rafal Japheth but then Ryan's name is Ryan and it kind of mimics the fact that there's the good brother and the evil brother and once again the evil brother killed 
the good brother in order to get what he actually wanted out in the story, which was true love, which in this case was his friend Eric. And overall, I think that's everything I want to touch on for this book that I can think of. I loved that Merlin was a kid. I thought that was super funny. It was really sad to see so many characters die. I swear to God, I was so convinced Wart was dead too for the longest time. I was hoping he wasn't, but like, thank God. But I really liked this book. I think it was super good. A great finale to this series. And if you're thinking of picking up the next series, I definitely would. I think it's a super fun time. I love this book and I just I just really enjoyed it. Like I said, if you have anything you want to discuss with me, feel free to leave me a comment down below. If it does contain spoilers, just make a little like spoiler warning at the beginning so no one else gets spoiled, but I genuinely loved this book and would love to talk to you guys about it if you're interested. So if you enjoyed this review, be sure to give it a thumbs up and comment down below any questions you might have or your thoughts on the book if you enjoyed it or if you didn't because I'm genuinely curious. I know I loved it and I hopefully you all did as well. Anyways, stay tuned for Thursday because I will be posting a video with all of my thoughts on all all of the books now that I have reread them this year so stay tuned for that and I will see you all in that video so until then bye <laughs>